This is an audio presentation for list 4373 on the topics of phonics and word study. I'll talk a bit about the book club that we did online. I'll touch on miscue analysis and then I'll give advice and tips for preparing for your read aloud project in the community. And I'll share some ideas for resources as well as some initial planning ideas to get you started. And once you get started with your project, as you learn more about your kiddos, you'll be able to adjust and be flexible with your planning and take ideas from the class. And, and I just mainly want to get you started on that project. So this was our agenda. Um, again, we're doing book club online. And I'll talk about some activities that you can do with your service project. So the first thing I want to talk about is an overview about phonics. And I want to talk about some of the letters and sounds. And you remember, we started our class with a discussion about phonemic awareness, which is the awareness of the smallest unit of sounds and words. And now we're adding print or text. And we'll be learning how to sort of systematically teach children letter-sound relationships, which we know as the alphabetic principle. I'm just going to go through some of the more common letter sound relationships and I tried to sequence these in terms of the order they're usually presented to children and just remember that we are also teaching children informally about phonics along the way but this presumes a more systematic approach an explicit approach to teaching phonics which you read about in put reading first and so short vowels are common sounds we have a apple a e eggs e I igloo I, O octopus A, and U umbrella A. Uh. And in class, I'll teach you some um, kinesthetic gestures we can do to teach children these letter sounds for short vowels. And the thing, too, I want to add about teaching phonics is we want to keep it multi sensory. This is especially helpful for children who face challenges in reading. And that's known as VAC, V A K T, and that stands for visual auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile. And so these posters help keep it at least visual and we can add to that auditory by helping them learn a keyword and the sound that goes with that keyword. And so here are some typical ones. You can use really use other words if you want, but this poster helps. Okay, moving on from short vowels. Again, this is the bus tour of phonics. We have silent E. And the rule is that silent E or magic E makes the vowel say its name. So instead of cat, we say cake and fad, fade. So a simple way to teach this is to take some CVC words like cap or bit or kit and add an E and show how that changes that vowel sound, right? We can also tell children the vowels are the stars of the words. And in this case, the silent E at the end of these one syllable words makes the vowel say its name. So this is a, just a rule children typically learn in first about first grade. It can be tricky for them. They'll still continue to write and spell words with short vowels, and they just have to simply learn this rule and apply it. We have another rule in phonics. Double the final letter in one syllable words. And so here we have some examples of that. Digraphs. These are consonant digraphs. There's, there are also vowel digraphs, which we'll get to, but consonant digraphs are two letters that make one sound, like in ch, or sh, or w, or z, or th, words. So these are two letters that simply make one sound. And I would add to that the ph, like in phone and photo. Vowel teams. Vowel teams are also known as vowel digraphs. So there are two vowels that make one sound, and generally it's the first letter that determines that sound, but that's not always the case. But we can tell children that these are vowel teams or vowel pairs, and so generally there are keywords that go with each. And they can be tricky because they don't always say what they are meant to say, like the EA, that second box, where it says cream dream bead team. Think of the word bread, B-R-E-A-D, and how it's actually a short E sound, F, and we say it bread. So we often have to add context or the meaning surrounding the word so that students aren't just looking at words in isolation. But we're adding to our decoding skills 
using context meaning and semantics when we decode. So more on that later, but generally these are called VAL teams with children or VAL pairs. Technically and linguistically they're called VAL digraphs. Remember that's two letters that make one sound. Okay, a type of VAL digraph is a diphthong. It's not diphthong, it's a diphthong to be technically correct, and it makes a gliding sound. For example, ah, ow, oo, an oi sounds. And so I encourage you to say some of these words out loud to yourself so you can hear that gliding sound of a diphthong. And remember, a diphthong is actually a vowel digraph. It um, generally makes one sound, but it's a gliding sound. Okay, bossy R. So we have all the vowels and followed by an R. And these are, can be trickier because you can't really separate out the er phoneme from the vowel that goes with it. So these just need to be learned. And again, the keyword method works like AR, R car, OR, OR, fork, ER, ER, HER, etc. And we just call it bossy R. All right, so those are some of the major sounds and letter sound combinations we'll see that children mainly learn in first grade and it's being pushed back now to kindergarten. So let's go over a few terms and ideas and concepts we need to know in terms of the terminology we use to talk about the teaching of phonics and word study. And so first of all, what we're talking about here and what we saw in the previous slides are graphophonemic relationships. So let's break that down and look at that term because you need to know it. So grapheme is a written letter representation. So it's what you see in print and in writing. And the phoneme is the sound that it makes. So remember, that's the smallest unit of sound. So graphophonemic is, the let again, letter-sound relationship, using specific letters to represent certain sounds. So what are the ways we can teach phonics? So let me just start out by saying the subject in itself has been controversial and subject to much debate. So there has been research to suggest that a, a code, the learning of the code is, is helpful to children, but the, how much and when and how soon has been subject to debate. So I want to go over some approaches to phonics that you'll see and hear in your classrooms and in your teaching careers. So things to be aware of. So first we have synthetic phonics. So students learn how to convert letters into sounds and then blend those sounds to form recognizable words. So this would be teaching like the word cat, k, at, and then blending that together, decoding by segmenting and then blending sounds. So breaking the word up into its constituent parts and then blending or synthesizing those sounds. So the key word is blending. And the trouble is not all words can be decoded or segmented. Um, and there are letter patterns that are irregular. So this while this is good, it doesn't always work with all letters and sounds. And analytic phonics is teaching children to look at the word and look for parts they know. So looking for chunks you already know and using that as an analogy. So if I can read the word cat, I can also read fat, hat, sat, mat, etc. I can decode those easily by analyzing the chunks or the parts that I know. And we call those chunks um, word families. So we generally can teach children to read by learning the word families. Another word for word families is rhyme, R-I-M-E, rhyme. And similarly to analytic phonics is analogy-based phonics, which we see endorsed by, for instance, Patricia Cunningham in Phonics They Use. Um, who, and in that book, you'll see she teaches generally analogy-based phonics, and that's children learning to use the parts of the word families they already know to identify and decode words they don't know that have those similar parts. And continuing, we can also learn phonics through spelling. So remember that reading, spelling, writing, um, vocabulary, phonics, these are all interrelated. Children learn through writing and children learn through reading. So children learn to segment the words into phonemes and make words by writing letters for those phonemes. And remember last time in emergent literacy, we talked about invented spelling, and it actually reinforces both phonics and phonemic awareness in young children. Another way to teach that is kind of the opposite of systematic phonics would be embedded phonics. So children are taught letter-sound relationships as they read. So it's more 
on the fly, if you will, or finding those teachable moments when children are decoding and you can do a, a mini lesson on the spot to help children learn skills, rules, um, and use their cueing systems to read as they're reading. The problem is it's harder to teach this because you're not able to predict what children will come across as they're reading. And then finally, onset rhyme, phonic construction. Children look at the initial sound and the ending chunk or the ending rhyme and blend those together. So overall, as you read and put reading first, the type of instruction that's favored right now generally is systematic and explicit. And just you need to know systematic means we have a sequence uh, set of lessons that we'll present to children. And that explicit means we're making these very well known and teaching them in more direct ways to children. We're not letting them assume the names of the letter sounds or simply being immersed in print, but making those letters sound relationship clear to children. And this might involve using activities where they're using hands-on learning, like making words, which we'll do in class, or they may be doing other activities where they're explicitly working with letter sounds. So one way we can teach is through word families. And what we can do is have children find and locate instances of a word family in print from their prior knowledge and in environmental print in the classroom. For instance, you can say, OK, we're going to be word detectives, and I'm going to give you two minutes or one minute or 30 seconds or whatever you decide, and set a timer and have the children use dry erase boards and list all the words they can think of from the at family. So they could draw a circle in the middle or make a list, and working together or alone, they can come up with as many words that have that rhyme or ending chunk at, like sat, fat, hat. And they really don't even have to be real words. They sh ideally, they should be. And then the children can go back and, and see how many words they came up with and maybe use the word in a sentence orally and then um, move on to some other activity. But it's a good way for them to practice word families and decoding by analogy. Another instance of teaching phonics that's visual and auditory and integrates uh, listening, speaking with learning to read is the idea of word sorts. And this comes from what I know, this comes from a book called Words Their Way. And what children do is they sort a group of words, generally like 12 to 15 words, and the words are on index cards or sticky notes, or they can just be on little cutout pieces of paper that the teacher has ready, and the children sort the words into two or three patterns. You can do this electronically, or you can do it with actual tangible paper, like I was saying, post-it notes or index cards, and you write one word per post-it note. And you can have them do an open sort, so you can have, for instance, short A words, and words with the short E sound, and their consonant vowel consonant words, and you can say, okay, sort them how you think they should go. And the children may inductively figure out that there are short vowel A words and short vowel E words, or I, I can't remember what I said, and that they can sort them accordingly. So they're looking for the pattern. And again, that's more inductive, and they have to figure it out. That's called an open sort. And a closed sort is where you say, okay, let's sort. We're going to sort these into two groups, and in the first group we'll have words like cat, and you might use pat as a header. And in the other group we're going to have short E words like hen, and then you have the children sort them, and that's a little easier and provides for more scaffolding in your word sort. So it just depends on your kiddos and where they're at. You can have up to three categories. Um, early emergent readers can do picture sorts, so you could sort by initial sound, for instance. So this is something, there's a whole continuum of easy to more complex in terms of word sorts. And it teaches children to visually recognize letter sounds. You can have them go back and read the words. You can have them use them in a sentence orally. So you're contextualizing this learning, and it's not just random words out of context. And that's really important, is to use, make the words meaningful. And it's especially important for your English language learners. And so let's revisit the reading continuum. Remember, we're moving from children just getting ready to read and write and engaging in pre-reading behaviors um, and all the way up to application of the alphabetic principle. And we call those children beginning readers. 
And as they become more fluent, we call them transitional readers. And our goal is to develop independent readers. So students need a one-to-one -one correspondence. And remember, last time we talked about children reading Sam Sam the Baker Man, and they had different degrees of ability to understand the concept of a word. So this is crucial to the development of beginning reading and decoding, is this concept of a word. OK, so we talked about decoding and graphophonemic relationships and some instances, instances of it. Children also rely on other cueing systems to cross-check for meaning when they're reading. And you, you know this because you've heard a child read, and they come to the end of a sentence, and they realize they read a word wrong. And it's not just their knowledge of letter sounds that helps them figure out what went wrong or self-correct when they self-correct that error or miscue. But they're also relying on other cueing systems. And Marie Clay, the late Marie Clay, has um, called this MSV. And it stands for children using their meaning cueing system or their knowledge of semantics or word meaning. The word itself and the word, the semantic, the semantics of the sentence and the semantics of the story, in fact. They're also using their knowledge of syntax or grammar of the language system in which they're reading. And so they're using their knowledge of the way that words go in the sequence that they go and grammar of nouns, verbs, adjectives, etc to help them predict what's coming up next in the sentence. And that will help them, too, to, to self-correct or read, read well. And then finally, what we've mainly been talking about is the visual cueing system or the graphophonemic cueing system. And it's not the only cueing system that we use when we read. So meaning, we read with meaning in mind, syntax, which is more unconscious, or as Chomsky says, part of the deep structure. Of our, of our mind, and we also use the visual or graphophonemic cueing system. So we're not just limited to phonics when we read and make meaning of print and text. OK, what we'll do in class soon is look at miscue analysis to look at the ways that children are using meaning, syntax, and letter sound relationships as they decode and make sense of print and text. So that's coming soon. And miscue analysis is really just listening to children read real, real print, real text, and analyzing the types of miscues that they're making. And a miscue is any time they depart from what the, print, the printed word says in the text. And there are many types of miscues, and we'll look at those. OK, so you're getting started. I want to shift gears and talk about your project and the ways that you're going to kind of think of lesson planning in your book club read aloud service project. So we'll, I'll call this lesson planning, but you're not really writing out formal lessons. But I want you to keep some things in mind to help make your learning purposeful and powerful. So think about your project and who you'll be working with. Um, and keep that in mind as I talk a little bit about what a lesson plan is and what you need to kind of keep in mind, even if it's not always written down. So a lesson plan is always systematic and intentional. You're not just going into a classroom scenario saying, we're going to learn about reading. You know, you want it to be more systematic than that. You want to say something like, we're going to be developing vocabulary knowledge of tier two vocabulary words. And the way I'm going to teach that is I'm going to have the words displayed. We'll, have, we'll discuss their meanings and come up with examples of the meanings of the words from our own lives. So it's systematic. You have a plan. And it's intentional. It's not vague or general. And with my second point, kind of going along with that, you have what's called specificity and detail. So if you are going to talk about vocabulary with a certain book, you actually have pulled those five to ten words. You know what they are. You know why you picked them. They're not just random. Um, they're not too easy, not too hard. And the detail would be you're actually going to write down or think about what you'll have the children do so that they can be immersed in those words and use them multiple times. Etc. So you need specificity in your plan, and you need detail. What are you going to do during that lesson? Here's the third key. Someone else can follow your plan. So if you have a written plan, you don't just say, discuss vocabulary. You actually have a plan where someone else can pick it up and follow it, as if you were following a recipe. So when you look at a recipe, some, anyone can follow it. 
you can pick it up and do it. It's not written in code. It's not written in something only you understand. It's written in this sort of third person, you know, direction. So these are just over overarching ideas for your thinking about how you'll be planning. And when you start out, sometimes as new teachers, we're overwhelmed by the m amount of what we want to teach children. So zoom in on, you know, critical concepts or themes you'll be teaching. With your book, for instance, if you're reading Julius, the Baby of the World, some critical concepts or themes in that book are family, jealousy, feelings. So maybe just pick one or two of those and, you know, maybe develop it through a character study of Lily so that you can really zoom in on that critical concept and keep it in mind because the children may take you off another direction and you need to stay focused as their leader while also being open, you know, to dialogue and discussion. And then think, how can I make this active for the students? So often students are sitting and, you know, the feeling and they're listening and they may or may not be engaged. So multimodal means they have, you know, it's hands-on, tactile. Can you give dry erase boards or paper and they can draw a picture of the story while they listen if they're real small. Maybe they can write down five words that came to mind about the story. Maybe they can, after they read, they can do a web about the characters using character trait words from a, a character trait list. And always set that purpose ahead of time. Say, we're going to be reading a story, but at the end, we're going to do a character analysis chart. I have a list of character traits, and I'm going to have us all go back, and together we're going to make this chart. Let them know ahead of time what the purpose is so that as you read, they can have that in mind, and it will guide your, your listening, and they'll actually attend a little better. How will the learning be student-centered? Again, um, it's not all about you. It's about the learner. It's not just about the teaching. It's about the learning that's going on. And then how will you assess your objectives? If your objective is you want students to do a character trait map, how will you assess that? Will each one do a graphic organizer? And what would be considered you know, well done and what would be considered average and what would be considered not passing? Um, it can be informal assessment, but you know, you need to state criteria to the children up front. And then how will you know? Do the students learn the concept you intended? So this is aligning our objectives, instruction, and assessment. And you need to check for understanding along the way, not just at the end, or they may be lost and you didn't know it until the end. So some ways that you can get students to show you their understanding is you can do kinesthetic things like you know, write a word to describe Lily on your whiteboard and everyone hold it up so we can see. And they're looking to each other too for feedback and input. Index cards like that say yes or no, thumbs up or down to respond, you know, yes, no, maybe, that kind of thing. Um, you can stop and, and say, what are we thinking so far about what's happening or what are, what's happening so far in the story to stop and check in for basic understanding and dialogue without interrupting the flow of the text. So I've posted on Blackboard some resources for finding children's literature, like the Children's Literature Database. And you can search in that database by theme, genre, age, level, award-winning books, etc. So I encourage you to look on Blackboard and find under Resources for Your Service Project the information on the Children's Literature Database through the UTA Library. All right. Finally, in any lesson, you always need closure. So at the end of your time together, say, what do we learn today? And why is this important? And I guarantee you, you might be working in a district that where this is required. And in fact, they'll come and monitor what are the last of students, what are you learning and why is it important? And the students at all times should be able to answer that. And same with your informal teaching and tutoring. It's a good it's good for you to get in the habit of doing that. I also encourage you to do simple assessments like checklists, rubrics, uh, kid watching. There's something called kid watching where you can notice levels of participation and, you know, informal observations, and you might even take a few notes. More formal assessments might be collecting a written response from students. You know, I don't, I don't suggest a multiple choice test, but you certainly can do a short one so students know if they understood the story. And in class, we're going to start working on our first sort of plan or getting ready, using the before, during, and after 
kind of format. You can take a look here and revisit the video I made, the YouTube video I posted on engaging kids when reading to and with them. And that's it. And if you have any questions, just shoot me an email, peggyseta.edu. Thanks.